like to move with second presentation with topic corneal topography in contact lens and optometry practice. So to guide on this today, we have another our another speaker delegate, Dr. Seja Naro. And Dr. Seja Naro is um, MSc Optum, a PhD, a fellow of European Academy of Optometry and Optics, American Academy of Optometry, International Association of Contact Lens Educators and British Contact Lens Association. He is also an editor-in-chief of Contact Lens and uh, Interior Eye Journal, president of International Association of Contact Lens Educators. Further, uh, he was also awarded International Optometrist Award by World Council of Optometry in year 2015. I welcome you, sir, on behalf of Advancing Optometry Educa uh, Education Committee, and we are privileged to have you at this session today. And now I would request you to proceed with your presentation. Great, so thank you very much for this very kind invitation. And uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Raksha, for uh, hosting and that kind introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about corneal topography and contact lens fitting. And you know, most of us will use a keratometer. We may use a manual keratometer in practice. Uh, I think a lot of practices now have the auto refractor auto keratometer type device. And remember that with these devices, we look at the central corneal curvature. We have these what we call one or two positioned uh, type of uh, keratometers, the traditionally known as the Bausch and Lomb style, uh, the Zeiss style, and the Javel Shorts type of uh, keratometers. The main pitfalls in keratometry, one is with a manual keratometer, of course, eyepiece focusing can make a difference. Now, those of you who are involved in any teaching will know that when your students measure um, K readings, they take the corneal curvature readings from their patient and you come to check them, you know, you find a very small difference here and there. And it may be because they haven't focused the IPs correctly. And also with keratometry, we assume that uh, that central area, that two to four millimeters is uniform. And actually it's been shown, there's a very nice paper from Arthur Bennett and where he showed that actually it's not uniform. Uh, every single point of the cornea is conical in its own right. So every single point has a different curvature. And there's a general problem that in, in the UK, we generally uh, work in millimeters when we're talking about um, contact lens fitting. Um, when people are taking keratometry readings for surgery, for example, they generally work in diopters. So you have to convert one to the other. And, um, and then it's, you know, there can be an issue of what refractive index you're going to use in that conversion calculation. But the main problem really is that in keratometry, you're only assessing the central corneal curvature, that central two to four millimeters. With a gas permeable lens, typically we'll be using an area uh, of nine to 10 millimeters diameter. Uh, with a soft lens, the diameter of a soft lens typically will be 13 to 14, maybe a little bit more, 14.2, 14.5 millimeters. So they, the, the, um, we, we want to know additional peripheral curvature information, which the keratometer does not give us. And certainly if you're going to be doing any specialist contact lens work, like fitting mini sclerals or scleral lenses or orthokeratology, then of course you want to know what's happening in the cornea in the periphery as well. Now there, there was an attempt in the 1960s, uh, Robert Mandel, he took the Bosch and Lum keratometer and he reduced the separation of the Myers and he was able to then get peripheral curvature measurements as well with this type of keratometer. There wasn't something which is done uh, routinely. It was done something in research. And, um, but of course you will only get a couple of points in the periphery rather than the whole corneal curvature, which topography can give you. Now, I don't know if some of the older practitioners on the call, they might be familiar with this machine, the Wesley Jessen a PEK, it was called the photoelectric keratoscopy. Um, I, I've never used this either, but I remember when I first uh, qualified and um, in the practice where I was working, the first practice I was working, that, that practice had been there for 20 years before. I don't, I don't remember, know exactly how long. And there were some very old records of patients uh, who had been seen, you know, 10 and 20 years before. And some of them had contact, lens, uh, contact lenses fitted using this photoelectric keratoscopy method. And it's quite a clever method because what would happen is um, you would take a photograph and it's a placido ring photograph and using a Polaroid camera. I don't know if anybody remembers the Polaroid cameras. These are the cameras which give you, uh, you take the picture and the photograph comes out the back. And 
And then you would scan that image using the old type of computer scanners. And you can see that in the top right of this slide, somebody's scanning the images. And then you would use the computer to find the apex and the principal meridians in that picture. And then you could, you take that information, that curvature information and translate it over to your lathe and you could cut your contact lens according to this. And this was used for hard PMMA contact lens fitting. And um, you know, so it, it was used for many, many years and uh, uh, you know, it, it obviously was successful as well. But the technology has become way out of date and it's become superseded by other things, of course, over the, the recent years. Now, some of the very important work in corneal topography was Stephen Kleist, Liam McGuire. And what they did was they took those photoelectric keratoscopy images, scanned them in, and then they gave them colors. They used color coding. And that was the first time we'd seen this color coding in corneal topography representation. And they put plotted these results and they basically said that, look, we'll give anything which is a steep contour, we'll give it a hot color. And anything which is a cold uh, color will, be, uh, will denote the flatter areas of the corneum. So if you think about the normal corneal shape, it, it's prolate. And what does that mean? Prolate means that it's steeper in the middle and becomes progressively flatter towards the edges. So in that typical cornea, you would have the steepest part, the red part in the middle, and then slightly sort of green and blues towards the, the edges and the periphery of the corneal shape. That's the prolate shape. So corneal topography kind of grew out of uh, these older things that we had out of this uh, computer scanning, out of this PEK photoelectric keratoscopy, but um, really out of that um, Kleiss and Maguire work of color representation. And corner topography essentially has a high resolution camera in the system, and it has a backlit Placido disc. Placido's discs have been around for over 100, nearly 150 years. Antonio Placido, he was a Portuguese ophthalmologist, and in uh, 1880, he basically um, took this black and white circles and used an external light to shine this off the cornea to see how the cornea shape distorted with these rings of uh, reflected light. And that's known as a placido disc. So when we're using modern topography, we sit our patient on the chin rest, similar to a slit lamp, they line up. We use this uh, XYZ manipulator base. Basically, that means it goes forward, back, right and left, up and down. And the patient sees a fixation target. We have some alignment myers, and those can be manual or they can be automatic these days. And the camera records the reflections and it records how deviated the reflections are from where they should be. And the more deviated they are, suggests steeper and flatter parts of the cornea. So in a typical corneal topography picture, this is a, a typical, what we call a with the rule astigmatism. Now we know this is with the rule astigmatism because in this particular picture, you can see there's hot colors in the vertical meridian. And if you imagine, imagine a midpoint, from the midpoint up and from the midpoint down, there's almost equal hotness above and below. So this is regular astigmatism. And we know it's with the rule astigmatism because in the vertical meridian, it is steepest. So it's steepest this way and flattest this way. So if you were doing a refraction on this patient and you found they had astigmatism, they would have a negative cylinder in their spectacle prescription horizontally. This is a keratoconic patient. Now in keratoconus, what we're looking for here is this steep protrusion. In keratoconus, we know this is an ectatic condition. The cornea steepens around the apex and um, I was always taught, you think of this, the cornea as what we call a balloon model. So if you imagine a balloon and it's full of air and you pull a point out of the balloon, you will get a, you'll get a, a steep apex. But somewhere else on the balloon, you get a stretching. So that's what you can see in keratoconus. You see this inferior part, which is becoming steep, and this part in the top here, which is stretched and becoming flatter because the corneal dynamics are pushing, oh, sorry, are pulling the cornea forward and there's this protrusion, this apex. <clears throat> this is a post-PRK photorefractive keratectomy patient, uh, but actually it could be post-ortho-K as well because this is the same sort of procedure that would happen. You would have that normal red area in the middle 
And post myopic PRK, we ablate, we remove with the laser some of the central corneal tissue and we flatten the central corneal tissue. And uh, we get this mid peripheral steepening and then the extreme periphery is, is untouched. So this is a post PRK. Like I say, you'd get a similar picture post orthokeratology as well. In fact, in this one, you can kind of tell it's PRK because the uh, flattened zone is about five or six millimeters in diameter. And that's roughly the PRK uh, laser ablation diameter. In orthokeratology, usually they're a little bit smaller than this, but, uh, but it's the same sort of picture. And one of the nice things we can do with, with uh, corneal topography, uh, you know, this is a real patient that I saw. This was post a corneal graft patient. So this patient had a full thickness, what we call a penetrating keratoplasty. And um, post corneal graft, this patient had quite a lot of irregular astigmatism and quite a lot of regular astigmatism. And their best corrected visual acuity was not coming up better than sort of 6, 12, 6, 9, something like that. And so what we did was we took the picture pre um, the treatment and then post what we did was we removed some sutures and so we let the sill relax in this case it was around the um, um, the 11 o'clock position we took some sutures out relaxed the meridian there and the corner topography became more regular afterwards and then you were able to uh, do a spherocylindrical refraction on this patient so going back to normal topography, this is the typical sort of normal image. When I see a topography picture, what I like to look at is I like to look at the eye image, the black and white image. I like to see that it's a good quality image. It's in focus. It's, there's not too much of a blink happening there uh, because if it's out of focus, that will affect the curvature readings. <clears throat> and then, of course, there's a color map and there's various types of color maps. But, color maps. We don't have time today to go through all the different types of color maps, uh, but there are lots. And if you speak to your local distributors about which topographers they, they have, they will teach you uh, about, about the color maps. But the other thing I like to look at is this bottom right image. I like to look at the red and the blue lines, the steepest and the flattest meridia, because if those are almost perpendicular, you can see that that's regular astigmatism. And the more irregular the astigmatism is, the more, the, sorry, the less perpendicular the red and the blue lines are. So there's less of a 90 degree angle between the two of them. And that's very important, especially over the pupil area, because that's the entrance pupil, the light going into the eye. In the periphery, it doesn't matter so much, uh, because of course that's not the, the pupil area. Now, this is uh, an example because now we've got this, uh, in fact, I should say also that, um, you know, your keratometer reads the steepest and the flattest meridian. The corneal topographer reads thousands of corneal Ks. And depending on which machine you have, it's anything from about 7,000 data points to up to 20,000 data points. So that's 20,000 corneal curvature points. If you get your mouse on a real topography image and move it around, it will tell you the corneal K reading at any single point. So it's a very nice map of the whole corneal curvature. So if we have that map of corneal curvature and we know that here's our contact lens that we're manufacturing, well, maybe we can manufacture the lens according to that curvature and we can custom make those lenses. So here's a made up example of a lens. And in this particular example, you can see that um, this, I've called this the alpha beta kappa lens and uh, there's other, uh, you can see the diameter is 9.8 millimeters. The R0, which is the BOZR or the base curve is 8.1. And the eccentricity is the shape factor. Again, I haven't got time to go into that today, but uh, it's, it's related to the shape of the uh, aspherity of the, um, the, the profile. So here we've got three examples. And um, this slide is courtesy of uh, Phil Morgan from Manchester. And here you've got the middle one, which is pretty much an alignment fit. And then we've deliberately steepened it on one side to a 7.7 BOZR. On the other side, we've flattened it to an 8.1. And you can see the changes in the simulated fluorescein patterns. So these aren't photographs of fluorescein patterns. These are, these are simulated fluorescein patterns. And what this is telling you is if you fit this curvature of lens, this is what will happen in terms of fluorescein pattern if you fit this one. And you can change these parameters. So we can say, okay, well, let's play with the diameter. We want to have uh, a fluorescein pattern that looks like this. And we'll change the diameter and see what happens. So you can change individual parameters. Okay, let's change the shape factor or the asphericity. Let's change the BOZR. Let's change something else. 
uh, about the lens. And in fact, some of the newer topographers will even uh, allow you to move the, the lens on the the, this, the image. So you can see what it would look like if the lens decentered as well or the patient was blinking. Now, just to finish off, uh, because I know we only have 15 minutes today, so I just wanted to give you a, an example of a real patient that I saw. And I, I saw this patient quite a while ago now. And um, this was an interesting case. This was a patient who was about, he was mid thirties at the time. And uh, he went to have laser surgery. And he was about minus two prescription in both eyes, roughly sphere. I can't remember exactly the full details, but roughly spherical in both eyes, minus two or thereabouts. And he looked up on the internet and he found out that he thought that for his prescription, um, he didn't want to have LASIK. He wanted to have LASIK, where they move the epithelium out of the way, they ablate the um, stroma, and they push the epithelial um, bandage, if you like, back and put a bandage contact lens on for a few days take the bandage lens off and uh, and then that, that's away. When he went to the clinic, the surgeon who saw him wasn't very experienced in LASIK and said to him, I think you should have LASIK and told him the advantages of LASIK. Now you could argue that LASIK has some advantages, of course, because you, you would get a quicker visual recovery, uh, quicker visual stability, although you could argue that it's more invasive, et cetera. So there's you know, counter arguments for him and we're not gonna go into that. But he had LASIK on one eye, on his left eye, absolutely fine, no problem. On his right eye, as the surgeon was cutting the flap with the microkeratome, the microkeratome had a problem and it bisected part of the flap. That basically means part of the flap, the, epi the stromal flap was lost and broken. So when the surgeon did the laser ablation and put the flap down again, there was a gap. There was a gap from the flap edge to the, the, the rest of the corneal bed, if you like. And what happened then in the healing process is that gap filled up with epithelial cells. And that gap you can see in this um, picture, this topography color picture, and it's roughly the bit from three o'clock to about five o'clock. And there's a sort of an arc there, if you like, which filled up with epithelial cells and it became very steep. It kind of overfilled. The central portion, you can see this flattening there, there's ablation there, and uh, there's a little bit of irregular astigmatism. Now, the number I want you to remember in your mind is this number here at the bottom the 8.25, because the 8.25 is the average K reading, the average curvature for this particular cornea. So just remember 8.25. Now, when this patient came into, uh, this, this patient was referred to me by a, a friend of mine who saw the patient after they, they went to the laser clinic and then they went to see an ophthalmologist. The ophthalmologist sent the patient to me and said, uh, can you fit a contact lens to this? And the patient came in, sat down and, um, you know, I thought, okay, the only way we're going to be able to manage this in that practice, um, we didn't have a lot of scleral lenses in that practice, actually. And this was kind of before the mini sclerals were becoming popular as well. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to fit him with a gas permeable lens. So I put a gas permeable lens on and I held it with his eyelids in place. And I was able to over refract him and bring him down to 6.5. You know, he was starting at six, a very poor 6.12 and I put him down to 6.5 five very easily just with a spherical gas permeable lens as soon as i let go of his lids the lens fell and the lens took the position of the apex in this picture and it sort of settled down there so i needed to get a custom made lens that was going to fit this cornea and i really didn't know how to start with this now i could have tried some keratoconic lenses because those will have those decentered apex uh, apices but in this case remember the center is flat as well so it was a bit more complicated than that so I kind of said to the to the machine, to the computer, can you tell me uh, what to do here? Now, the topographers have built in software to help you simulate contact lens fitting. And that's what I used. So this was the first lens that I tried. And this was on the Bosch and Lamorb scan machine. Remember, his average K was 8.25. So the orb scan suggested I fit him with an 8.00 BOZR lens, total diameter 9.8. And you can see the floating pattern is quite steep, but that was the lens that was suggested. And in fact, I ordered this lens, he tried it, it, it destabilized straight away, it didn't stabilize at all. So I ordered something else, I went steeper. And in fact, not only did I go steeper, but I also used a bigger diameter, which increases the sag. So now I've gone for a 10 millimeter lens and a 7.9. You can see the fluorescein pattern looks steeper still. So this is the first one, and this is the second one. So there's more fluorescein there, as you can see. Again, lens didn't center. It didn't, it, uh, it didn't um, uh, it locate very well. It just kept on decentering. And he, you know, he was obviously unhappy with that. 
Now, the next thing I did was I was at a conference. I was at the BCLA conference, British Contact Association, and I met uh, somebody from a company called Northern Lenses in the UK. It's a small independent um, manufacturer of specialist lenses. Uh, I, I sat with the owner and we discussed this case and he helped me to draw out a lens on his on his software. And we literally we sat there and drew out a lens and what we were going to how we we're going to make this lens. And this is the lens that we ended up with. Now, the lenses that he was making, they're called wave lenses. They're not wave front lenses, but they are custom made lenses based on topography. And how he explained this to me was in a gas panel lens, typically the, the lens is lathe cut. So you have a, a sharp blade cutting the lens and the lens rotates. With this lens, he said, what I do is I, we punch out the lens. So the lens is punched out to any shape. So that's what we did. So now th th this bit slide is quite complicated. So I'm going to talk you through this one slowly. So. The picture on the on the uh, one side of the topography picture on the one side here, you can see there's a line roughly four o'clock. At that four o'clock line, the curvature of this contact lens or the BOZ of this lens is 8.46. And the um, the power at that particular point is, uh, where's it gone? There it is. Um, sorry, it's not 8.46, sorry, here it is. The, 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 at that four o'clock line, the base curve of the lens is 8.29. Okay, and the power of the lens is minus 0.81. The same lens at the three o'clock position, the power is plus 0.38 and the base curve is 8.54. Remember before his base curve was about 8.25 average. Well, now at the three o'clock position, we've got a lens with a base curve of 8.54 and a power of plus 0.38. And the four o'clock position, it's minus 0.81 and the base curve is 8.29. So Anywhere you put the cursor, you can see a different curvature and a different power. So this lens is essentially made to fit that cornea. Now you can see here, this is the rest of his prescription. He actually ended up post-surgery plus one minus two. So you can see his mean spherical equivalent is, is almost zero, but he's got this minus two sill, which is why he wasn't seeing so well. Of course, the gas permeable lens creates a tear lens, which masks the irregularity. And that's why we were able to give him good vision. Now, in, in the practice where I did this, um, I wasn't, we didn't have a digital slit lamp camera there. So I actually took this picture with my phone and uh, you can see it's a very poor quality picture. But if you look at the simulated fluorescein pattern, you can see that there's this vertical pooling and then this sort of arc of pooling inferiorly. That's pretty much what the, uh, the photograph shows you. There's an arc of pooling horizontally and a vertical pooling of fluorescein uh, going upwards from the bottom to roughly the middle. If you're interested, this was the, the rest of the parameter that, of the lens. It was a Boston Exo material, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But that was the, the lens. He put it on, straight away it fit, and he read 6.5 straight away. The last point is, was he happy? No, he wasn't. <laughs> was I happy? I was hilarious. I was delirious, sorry. I was really happy with the, the, the outcome because you know he had a really good result. So I, I was really pleased. This was the first time I'd fit in this type of lens. Was he happy? No, because he was a patient who was giving up soft lenses to have refractive surgery, which went wrong. And now we had to have this specialist lens and all these additional appointments and this quite expensive lens, which took me three lens attempts to get it right. Um, there is a sort of, a, I suppose, a, a happy ending to the story. He came back about five years later because the lens was very scratched and I refitted him with the same type of lens again. So he did continue wearing these lenses. He saw the benefit, but he wasn't happy because of the, the outcomes of the surgery more than anything else. I think that was my last slide. So thank you very much. Um, I know that was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but hopefully you'll see the benefits of topography and contact lens practice uh, are not just replacing your keratometer, but you can do a whole load more. And I, I know that other people are going to speak about that as well today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure.